Okay, I just opened up the room. So we'll let it populate here for a little bit and then we'll get started. Okay, so I just come off mute, I guess, whenever I wanna. Yep. All right. Well, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for I Am Online. This is Dean Woodbeck with In Common and Internet 2. I Am Online is brought to you by In Common Internet 2 and also the Educause Higher Education Information Security Council. A couple of things before we start, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen in Zoom, there is a button that says chat. Uh, in order to see the chat, you have to click that button. When you do, you will see that the two on the chat says all panelists if you would click the drop down on that, you'll see a selection that says all panelists and attendees. Uh, select that one if you're going to use the chat to ask questions. Uh, that way everybody can see those questions. And then as the presenters are uh, uh, ready to pause or at a point where it's, it's a good spot to interrupt, we'll do that and get your questions answered. So you can see today our topic is containerization, streamlining operations and reducing downtime. And our three speakers today are Paul Kasky from Internet2, Paul Riddle from, the universe, from UMBC, and Chris Southern, also from UMBC. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Paul Kasky. Paul? Hello, welcome. Good afternoon and late morning, and wherever else you are, good, good day to you. Um, thank you all for joining us. Certainly was an exciting topic, hoping uh, that we can uh, answer all your questions and everything here. Basically, I'm just going to kick it off today, and I'll be watching the um, chat, so let us know if you have any questions. Um, first of all, we, we hear increasingly this phrase, in common trusted access platform. Some of you may not be familiar with what that is. And, you know, you may know us as TIER. This is what came out of the tier effort. Tier was Trusted Identities in Education and Research. That was a community-led effort to establish what we now call the In Common Trusted Access Platform. And one of the things pertinent to today's conversation that the In Common Trusted Access Platform does is maintain packaged versions of popular uh, IAM open source software, namely, the Shibboleth IDP and SP, Grouper, CoManage, and Midpoint. And so, you know, you may wonder why do we hear so much about containers? Why are containers cool? Why is it the latest cool thing, you know? Um, 
Containers are really important for a, a number of reasons. They make operations a lot easier on your part, and they make distributing software a lot easier on our part. So that's a complete little unit of information that uh, you can use to um, deploy the software in a known, reliable way. Paul Riddle is going to have a lot more on that in just a minute, so I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail on containers right now. But suffice it to say that we do this uh, to facilitate things like cloud deployment. Uh, we make software easy to deploy, easy to deploy. We uh, make something that lends itself well to a CI, CD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous de delivery. And so there's a lot of reasons to, to look at containers. And on your side, you get reduced complexity and ease of deployment. So um, you'll hear a lot more about that from Paul Riddle in just a moment. So without further ado, I will kick it off uh, first to Paul Riddle. From UNBC, as Dean said, Paul's going to be talking uh, about containers and also about how they've uh, used the uh, Trusted Access Platform SHIB IDP container in their operations. And then when Paul's done, Chris Southern will be coming on and talking to you about um, a grouper container using the In Common Trusted Access Platform grouper container and also some uh, new stuff he's got planned. So without further ado, it's all yours, Paul. All righty. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon slash late morning, whatever time zone you're in. Um, so anyway, uh, I was trying to come up with a cute title for my presentation, and I came up with Jump On In, The Water's Fine, um, which is only somewhat accurate. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with swimming pools, but the, the old the old thing is when you, you get to the pool and your friend's already in there and he says, oh, the water feels great. And so jump on in. So you stick your toe in and um, and uh, he's like, oh, it's a little cold. So maybe I should like take this a little more slowly. Um, so what we did was, is, this isn't really so much um, us jumping in, but we actually, it's more more like we got our toes wet with containers before we really took the plunge. And now that we're actually in the pool, we're telling you all to go ahead and take the plunge because the water's great. So tables are turned now. So anyway, uh, on to the next. Okay, thanks, Dean. Um, so anyway, we got started with containers with our Shibboleth IDP. Um, and it actually worked out really well because the um, right around when when we were ready to start doing it, the, the all former tier containers came out and we were able to make use of those. So anyway, up until I guess last year, 2018 seems like more than a year ago, but up until last year, we, we had a pretty standard architecture for our Shibboleth IDP where we had three VMs and they were all running behind an A10 load balancer. Um, and actually, there, one of them was actually a physical machine actually in a rack, which is kind of becoming more rare nowadays. But um, so anyhow, it was three standalone machines behind a VM. Um, and we run the IDP behind a homegrown single sign-on platform that we've run since 2000, um, written in Perl. Um, just a little trivia there. Um, and that sits in front of the IDP and handles all of our front end auth. And we're still running that right now that we're trying to phase it out. Um, as far as the IDP goes, which we're going to be talking more about than the SSO itself, um, the IDP was the configuration was maintained in some version. So every time we wanted to make a change to say our attribute filter, we would go in on one of the nodes, which was a sort of standby and we would, we would edit the configuration, check it into subversion, and then we would log in to um, each of the other ones in succession and check the change out, restart, make sure everything's good, and then uh, everything was, was um, ready to go at that point. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, um, Dean. Thanks. So it was a pretty standard setup and it worked great, but there were some things that could be better. Uh, since we were propagating changes manually, 
it was a little tedious and we kind of had to make sure we did it in off hours and kind of stage it out so that we were taking nodes out of the load balancers we were restarting them and moving things in manually and stuff like that so it was a little bit of a pain and besides that it could actually um, lead to inconsistencies particularly if you have a, a node that's out of service or something um, we, we had that happen a couple of times where one of our vm hosts might be down and um, we had to propagate a shib change so everything goes goes up and then six hours later or whatever the node that's down comes back up and then all of a sudden one of your idps is out of sync which is not necessarily something you want um, so on, besides that upgrading packages was a little bit of a pain because um you have a bunch of supporting packages, obviously, to run the IDP, one being Java, one being either Jetty or Tomcat, your container management system, or your, um, sorry, your, um, <clears throat> your Java server environment. And um, if you don't stay on top of keeping those upgraded, they tend to get stale. And everybody likes to say, oh, you know, we, we make sure we keep Java up to date, we make sure we keep Tomcat up to date or whatever, and they're releasing new versions rather frequently and we, we just weren't keeping up with it. So we would end up with stale versions of Java and Jetty that may have had security issues and things like that. So just not, in general, not what you want. Um, auto scaling is the, the idea that when you have high demand, uh, you, uh, you can roll out new nodes sort of to meet the demand and then sort of scale back as the demand drops like say at the beginning of the semester you might want to spin up a bunch more idps now where we are we're sort of a smaller university small to medium and we don't necessarily see that as much with shiv but it's sort of one of those things where you have if you have a load balanced app and you have some uh, periods of high demand you might like to do that um and a static configuration with just a few VMs doesn't really give you that capability. So anyhow, we come to the next point where containers can help to address all of this. Now for us, um, around when the tier initiative launched, which is now the common trusted access platform, Around when that launched, we, I had sort of heard of Docker and was familiar with the concept of containers and what they might do, but they weren't really on my radar or for, uh, for that matter, anybody else's radar on campus. So the whole thing was um, we weren't really sure what they could do for us. And I sort of had an idea that could be, they could be helpful and help to address some of these issues, but we weren't really sure what, what the whole story was with them. So go ahead to the next slide, Paul, um, Dean. So one of the things we did was, as Tier was starting to start to, to ramp up, as we got familiar with the whole concept of containers and what they do, uh, because they are similar to VMs in a way, but they're not. They um, they actually they they don't do any hardware emulation. They don't have their own kernel, uh, so you're not actually you're not actually um, you're not actually emulating an entire machine. You're just sort of running the operating system within that machine's own OS kernel. So it's sort of a lightweight VM. Um, and one container typically packages a single application or service. That's another way they differ from VMs, whereas your VM is essentially the same thing as a physical machine, or at least you think of it as the same thing as a physical machine, where the machine runs an operating system and the operating system might run multiple different services, such as a web server, you know, various different things like that. Whereas the whole philosophy behind containers, where one container might run one package, and if you have an application that uses multiple different software packages, such as um, something that runs a web server and might run a, a database server and, and um, maybe an LDAP server or something like that, 
the typical philosophy with containers is that you have one container per service. So you would actually have, you would have a container running your database, you would have a container running your web server, you would have a container running your LDAP server. Now that's not something that's enforced. You can have a container because the container will actually run an OS image. So a single container can run more than one service. Um, but um, the actual, the real philosophy is for, for one service per container. Now with our SHIB IDP, we actually do run our web single sign-on platform in the same container as the IDP because it, um, the, um, the single sign-on platform has some, um, has some issues with session management. So it, it, it needs to sort of run in the same container. Um, <clears throat> but ideally what I'd like to get to is um, actually networking them together so that they, they talk to each other over a, a private network. So anyway, I don't know if any of that made sense, but that, that's sort of a general intro to containers. Containers are actually built from what's known as images. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. And, and uh, Paul, uh, kind of Paul, before you go on, there's a question from uh, David Bantz about whether the container does its own TLS or SSL or if it relies on something else. It can. You can have a container that runs Apache with mod SSL. And that's just like any web server. Apache sort of will do its own SSL negotiation and and handle all of that. Um, now, if you're looking at pushing stuff out to the cloud, like say AWS or something like that, AWS, if you're running behind like, like, an, like an AWS load balancer, it likes to do the SSL termination. So what you would do in that case is you would run, you would, you would spin up your container and you would run it, uh, you would configure it to run behind a reverse proxy. And then the, the AWS load balancer would, would do the SSL termination and then pass, pass everything over plain HTTP. Um, <clears throat> so in, in that, that becomes important when you're, when you're moving to the cloud. So, um, but then when you're still running on site and you want to sort of prepare for that, like say you're, you're running an on-prem IDP and you want to eventually move it out to AWS, you might take it and, and set it up ahead of time so that it can function as sort of behind a reverse proxy. And in that case, you would set up a second container running something like Nginx or Apache, which would do the SSL termination and then proxy requests down to the IDP. So, so yes, if you're, if you're running Apache with mod SSL, it kind of can do its own SSL type stuff, but but things are, as moving out to the cloud, they're kind of moving towards SSL termination handle, uh, being handled outside the container. So basically either or. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. Um, so anyway, the, um, to run a container, you have to have an image, which is sort of the blueprint for running the containers. And this is where sort of the DevOps philosophy comes into the mix where your uh, system administration kind of becomes sort of akin to software development. So if you're building an image, you actually have something that's similar to a make file where you say, okay, I want to start with CentOS, CentOS or something, a base operating system. Then I want to take that and I want to install Apache on top of that. And then on top of Apache, I want to install, you know, PHP. And then on top of all that, I want to install my app. And then, from there, I'm building another image. And then I have an image that has my entire service sort of encapsulated. And the cool thing about images is they can be shared in what's called a registry. So once you've built your image and you think somebody might be able to make some use of it, you can upload it to a registry and then other people can download it and use it to generate their own containers. So it sort of becomes this entire ecosystem um, I'm going to get into Docker the next slide, but the, what the, the most popular container registry is called Docker Hub. And if you go to Docker Hub, you can get images for all sorts of different things. 
And you'll find that, you know, if you just want to run an application with Apache, PHP, MySQL, or something like that, or something like, coincidentally, the SHIB IDP, you'll go into Docker Hub and you'll find that somebody's already created an image that, image that you can use and just add your own stuff and then kind of go and you're not really having to do all this manual installation of prerequisites yourself. So that's one of the cool things about containers. Um, so anyway, how do I run all this? And that's where Docker comes in. Um, well, probably everyone's heard of Docker, um, but may not have used it. Um, Docker is, I'll just sort of regurgitate my thing here. It, it's an ecosystem for building packaging and deploying applications using containers. So it's, it's essentially an entire container management platform. So you'll use it to build your images and you'll use it to push your images up to a registry, you'll use it to grab images that others have uploaded to the registry and, and extend them. And then you'll actually use it, it runs as a daemon. It, you, so you'll actually use it to run your containers. So at boot, at boot time, you'll, you'll run the Docker daemon and then it will fire up all your containers for you and run all of your services. Um, Docker is, available for most common OS platforms. There are packages for CentOS, there are packages for Ubuntu. Uh, you can pay for it if you want, which will buy you some support and it will buy you some, some bells and whistles for the enterprise edition. But the free community edition is, is perfectly functional and it will, um, it, we run the free edition, we don't actually pay for Docker. So it's, it's fully functional if you are comfortable doing your own support and don't need some of the bells and whistles that the Enterprise Edition provides. And just to that point, there are some other management platforms. I'm not really familiar with anything other than Docker. Um, Docker is by far the most popular, established, and widely used. So, so that's pretty much that. Uh, next slide, please, Dean. Um, there were some questions real quick uh, about um, how you view the security of the image that you use that from the Docker registry. Okay, well, um, obviously the registry itself um, signs the images and, and, um, and stuff like, you know, there's, 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 Im there's security on the image itself. Um, but as far as who vets these images, I believe, Paul, you might know more about this. Um, Docker does yeah. have, um, I know Docker does have a, a sort of a certification um, a program where they'll, they, they will actually certify images. I don't know, you might have to pay money. For the most part though, I think if you just upload something, they don't actually vet it. Do you know more about that, Paul? Yeah, I, well, I can explain the the container security model. Um, the repo that is used to build those containers is all open and public. It's at github.internet2.edu slash docker. And the source for all the containers that are published in Docker Hub is there. Um, specifically on many of them, as many as we can, I would say it that way, we are actually running security scans. I'll give you an example on this. Our containers are based on CentOS 7. A couple of weeks ago, CentOS 7 still hadn't published their latest service pack that Red Hat Enterprise had published. It, was, it wouldn't build because it was failing the security check. It was finding vulnerabilities in the operating system. And so we, we, we go that far. And you can look at all of that when you look in the repo. You can look at the, it's all done by Jenkins, so it's automatic. Um, and that, that's how the things get in Docker Hub. So it's about the process that, that it goes through to get up there and things are tested. All that happens automatically before it ever gets pushed to Docker Hub. Cool, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, anyway, all the talk about, um, about containers and and images brings us to the package shibboleth IDP, which which is shipped as shipped by the 
trusted access platform. And we've been using this since pretty much since it came out. Um, and it is an image, it's on Docker Hub, pretty much like all the other images on Docker Hub. And it includes basically everything in the box that you need to run the IDP. So that includes Java, that includes the um, sort of a container, which I believe currently is Tomcat. Um, it works out of the box. So you would just pull the image down from, from Docker Hub and add your own attribute filter, add your own attribute resolver, and then you build your own custom image based on that and run it. And it's, you have an IDP in a box. Uh, and one of the nicest things about it is that it is much easier. It takes a lot of the fuss out of upgrading. You don't have to worry about individually maintaining Java. I honestly am not even sure what version um, of Java the trusted access ver um, uh, image is using anymore because it just works. Um, so it takes a lot of the sort of low level stuff out of running the IDP. And it also makes upgrading very easy because you would just pull the latest image and rebuild and you'll get the latest version of the IDP, the latest version of the um, server container and the latest version of Java. So it's really nice, it's all in one. Uh, and what I have found is that as we've been running this and we've been upgrading it over time, the main thing that we have to worry about when we're upgrading is taking care of, of up, keeping our configuration updated because every time a new version of the IDP comes out, various different things are deprecated. So when I start a new container up, I'll get warnings saying that this feature X, feature Y is deprecated. So you need to, re you need to actually uh, update your configuration to reflect that. So it helps us keep our configuration up to date and helps keep the underlying packages up to date. And things are much less likely to get stale and there's no more building the IDP by hand and tailoring the VM to run whatever the latest and greatest version is. So, Next slide. So anyhow, this, this all sounds great. Um, but when it first came out, we were sort of flailing around. Nobody, nobody around here, nobody at UMBC really had any experience running containers. And we really didn't know where to start. So, so we just sort of jumped in. We got a development uh, Docker server up and running and we fired up the tier package and we sort of learned as we were going. I did a lot of Googling. I did a lot of reading of sites like Stack Overflow and various other sites like that and just sort of came up to speed with Docker on my own. And sort of unique to me, I guess, is I'm on the Shibboleth training team and we had to start um, teaching this stuff to others as part of our training that we offer a few times a year. And the first one we did, I think it was back in 2018 at Lafayette, we were doing these packages and I really had never even used Docker. So I was sitting here looking over people's shoulders, trying to help them out with this and sort of learning as I go, which was lots and lots of fun, but it was also kind of, um, kind of scary. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so anyway, we, uh, we sort of just sort of pulled ourselves up um, and sort of learn as we go. And what we did was we, we got our feet wet and we ran one node, we replaced one of our nodes with a VM running Docker and the tier Dockerized IDP and we load balanced it with the rest of our, our stuff. And we ran it for a while to see how it goes. And it actually ran pretty well. It handled all of our load beginning of the fall semester so it went well. Um, go ahead, next slide. So that's essentially what we did um, um, to sort of get ready to run this. We bootstrapped it and we ran it and observed that's sort of what I just, uh, what I just um, went over. 
So we, we had two standalone VMs still in, in, um, in the rotation, but we bumped them down to a lower priority and then we ran the containerized with the higher priority to see how it handled the load and it handled it really nicely. So go ahead to the next slide. And that's sort of a picture of what we, how we got started. Um, we, we sort of found that we could, um, we could um, get by with just two VMs. So we, we put the second VM in lower priority and then ran the first VM at the higher priority. So next slide. So the next, the next um, sort of, um, the next step was we took our non-containerized IDP out and we put a second containerized IDP in, and then we just ran them both. Um, both instances were running identical copies of the container based on the same images, and then we added a local um, Docker registry so that we could share them and pull from each server the, the identical image which is sort of getting to where we want, but not quite as automated as we would like, because we're still pushing the containers out manually. So go to the next slide. And that's basically a picture of that is actually what we're running today is two VMs, each running Docker, each running identical containers, and then there's sort of the Docker registry where we store things. And we switched from, from subversion to Git to manage our repositories and that's all done locally still too. So idea being eventually we'll push these this stuff all out to the cloud, but we're not quite there yet. All right, next slide. And so now that we're at that point, uh, we're looking at our next steps. Um, first, first bullet point is sort of neither here nor there. We want to get rid of our legacy web single sign on system, which is really getting, and we want to have uh, moved to using the IDP for everything, uh, which will make things easier. And we're talking about running behind reverse proxies and eventually pushing out to the cloud. So we don't have this extra moving part that we have to deal with that has to handle the front end auth authentication. Um, enterprise sort of cloud based Git, we'd like to, we'd like to get to that from, from what we're doing locally. And the same thing with the Docker registry. We're looking at AWS Elastic Container Registry for possibly doing that, um, which would get us off our standalone VMs and just um, move us to sort of a pure container environment. And um, that would also move us towards being able to do a, a CI CD type thing, which is sort of our eventual goal of automation where you make a change, check it into Git, and it's automatically rolled out. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting closer. Um, um, we are also moving a lot of our infrastructure out to the cloud. Our IDP is currently all on premise, um, but um, we are moving towards putting it out to the cloud. And that would, container orchestration is sort of a nebulous um, thing for us right now. We're not really, we haven't really seen a huge need for it yet in auto scaling and, um, and that kind of thing. But getting out to sort of a cloud-based solution would sort of give us the ability to do that and sort of push things out and use Kubernetes or some sort of orchestration platform like that. We're certainly nowhere near being able to do that yet, but we're getting there. So anyway, I think that's my, I think that's my part. Um, so I see a bunch of stuff in the, um, uh, do, well, you know, one of, one of the things is about keeping your configs in sync and whether you uh, try to do a mount for those configs or whether you burn them into your uh, containers. Yeah, sorry, say again, Paul. Sorry about that. Um, one of the questions was about, you know, container, I mean, your config files and versioning those keeping them all current and in sync and related to that was, you know, uh, do you mount them or burn them into the containers? Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, right now we're burning them in. Um, and yes, um, 
config changes do require restarting the container. So right now we're sort of still in a, um, since we have two behind a load balancer, we'll do one at a time and just sort of roll them out. Um, we looked at using secrets, um, but um, it just ended up being more of a logistical thing than we wanted to deal with at the time. We just want to sort of keep it simple and we, we might reevaluate that at some point. But right now everything's baked in. So you roll out a change and you restart. Now, one thing we had thought about, one thing that might make sense would be to um, share the configuration in what's known as a Docker volume, um, which would you could then make changes within the volume and use the IDP's facility for auto reloading. So then you could then make changes to the attribute filter, attribute resolver, in the volume and it would get picked up automatically without having to rebuild the containers. That's actually something I'm looking at possibly doing in the near term to sort of um, sort of cut down on the need to um, rebuild and restart the containers every time you're making the tiniest little change. So I'm hoping something like that might help us out. Okay, um, one more question. Uh, how many IAM technical staff do you have? Um, we have, Two and a half. <laughs> we have myself, um, and we have another guy that does sort of the LDAP and a lot of the um, internal I, um, IDM sort of processes. And then um, we have Chris, who is sort of half time on IDM doing grouper. So we're not a huge staff. <laughs> okay, very good then. Uh, I think we can move on to Chris now. Thank you, Paul. All right, as Paul Chris, said, good morning. You. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks. So, good morning, afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, so, like Paul said, you know, uh, we have a small staff, and for me, Grouper is the I do it when things need to be done. Um, so, this is part of the reason, um, you know, containers have been valuable to us. So, some things I want to talk about is, you know, our move from going the old style manual Grouper, to, I mean, um, manually installed Grouper to the containers. And then some of the advantages um, and a little off topic from internet to and common stuff is, uh, you know, some other areas we're planning on using containers outside of Grouper. Uh, for us specifically, PeopleSoft and the pain points. If any of you are PeopleSoft shops, you know how painful it is to uh, patch every quarter. And then kind of our desired direction. Next slide, please. So transitioning to group containers, um, prior to using it, I, you know, we struggled with the initial setup, installing the software, configuring it. Um, you know, there were lots of the similar files or same files in different places. So it was really kind of a hard job, you know, initially. Um, we spent a lot of time doing this, figuring out the right configuration. Um, maintenance became neglected. I mean, we would have two servers running. Sometimes we would do, testing on one and then didn't update the other. Um, our code base would get out of, you know, out of sync. And then we didn't patch. Um, not the patching was hard, it was just, you know, just manual steps you had to run through. And with me doing other things, it was just things that got skipped. So um, in 2017, we joined the uh, Canvas Success Program um, for tiered containers, now Trusted Access Platform. And for us, that was a, a huge step forward, getting together with like-minded people in similar situations. Um, we're still fairly small with our group usage, but we're rapidly growing. We constantly get people saying, oh, this is a great way for uh, uh, us to use Grouper. Um, so Grouper was once something you could take down for a couple hours to now we need it up all the time. Um, so we went live with Grouper um, in the container version in the summer of 2018, and we've never looked back. It's been great for us. Next slide, please. So uh, the good thing about containers and Docker is when we started this, I didn't need a doc didn't need to be a Docker expert. Um, you know, and like Paul said, we really didn't have much around here that we did with it. This is our first. Uh, putting our toes in the water, as he said. So the nice thing about it is setup is pretty simple. You know, I basically took the configuration files I had from all the effort prior um, and put them, you know, brought them, tweaked them a little bit and then moved them into the, uh, you know, copied them into the, the image, um, as Paul was saying, you know, with Docker. 
and they run. I mean, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's not that simple, but it's not far from it. So, you know, one of the advantages is patching is simple. You know, we just go out there, modify our Docker file with the um, patch we want, and then build our image so that downtime is minimized. Um, that's very convenient for us. Um, there, you know, with the other advantage is there's a lot of support options that we found. Um, the Slack channel, which some of you probably use, I see a lot of um, activity on it all the time, and of course, email. Um, you know, for us, it's scalable. When we started it, we only needed one application server and one web server. Now, you know, we've scaled up to two because, as I said before, we find ourselves um, needing this all the time. We, you know, we're using it for students' access to uh, campus television, for example. Um, and, it, you know, any changes you make for customizability, it, it's simple. You modify your um, configuration files, you rebuild your image, and then you run it. Um, so for us, it's it's been a win so far. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, my, my discussion of Grouper is actually kind of simple because, or short, because it it does what it, you know, it's meant to do. The containers make it simple. They make us, you know, just download the latest image we want and run it. We spend most of our time now configuring Grouper from adding new um, provisioners or new, th new things to be provisions, new data to be loaded. Whereas before we would spend um, a reasonable amount of time actually, uh, you know, maintaining the application, making, like Paul said, making sure we had the, the right version of Java and Tomcat. Um, but, you know, some of the areas we're using Grouper for is, uh, you know, we're pulling student data, HR and financial data from Oracle. Uh, PeopleSoft system. We are pulling campus portal data from MySQL, uh, our warehouse data from SQL Server, and affiliations from LDAP. Um, now, we're, we provision to uh, EduPerson entitlement for um, specifically the uh, students who get access to campus TV. Obviously, they want their, their TV, so that's a good use of that. Um, we provision groups into LDAP, AD, and Google. Um, some examples, like I had mentioned with the Xfinity, uh, we also do email lists that we provision over into Google. We do, do access rights for advisors. Um, that's an interesting one is that whenever we wanted to have somebody get advisor rights, somebody would have to manually go into the um, portal. Now we can just do it with a simple um, add them to the group and it, they automatically get access to all the advisor pages in PeopleSoft. Um, so, you know, as you can see, we're, you know, we're doing a lot more of the functional aspect of, of um, Grouper than the technical maintenance. The next slide, please. So, um, where do we go from here? Like I said, Grouper has been great in Docker for us, um, but we do have some, some challenges ahead and maybe challenges isn't the right word, just moving to that next step, kind of like Paul was mentioning. Uh, we do need an image repository. Um, you know, we're right now I'm building them on each server, which is not ideal because you could still wind up with things out of sync. Um, you know, with a, it's still somewhat of a manual process because of that. And um, ultimately, like Paul was mentioning again, we're planning on moving this up into AWS and then using a container management system. Well, orchestration isn't that important for here, but um, we do have other areas where it will be. Next slide, please. So where are we going to use containers outside of the trusted access platform? Um, we currently start, I mean, I'm sorry, we've uh, recently started creating images to run PeopleSoft student financials and HR systems. And when I say recently, within the last few months, um, the maintenance cycle of PeopleSoft is endless. We do quarterly patching. Um, it's very labor intensive. We estimate about 300 hours a quarter to perform patching everywhere from development to production. Um, and it has, it's prone to errors. Um, we'll discuss some of those in the uh, next few slides. Next slide, please. So the PeopleSoft patching cycle, once again, is labor intensive. We have to apply OS patches, Java patches, WebLogic patches, Tuxedo patches, and PeopleTools patches 
to every physical server. Um, we have to reconfigure every application server and process scheduler domain, and we have to redeploy every web server. And we have to make sure SSO files get copied to every server. This, you know, prone to errors. If you miss one thing, it's going to show up. Um, next slide. So to put this into perspective, we actually have 19 web server machines, 16 application server machines, and six database servers. Database don't really play as much a role in this as the web servers and application servers, but um, just showing the sheer number of machines is, is kind of helpful, I think. Next slide. So once again, there's the, there's the physical aspect of patching in PeopleSoft, and then there's the service patching. Um, the, for the physical aspect, we have a number of machines that are campus solution specific, HR specific, and finance specific. We have development servers, production, um, gateway servers, which is communication between the various systems, and FHIR, which is our change management system. So for each of those boxes, we have to apply, once again, the OS patch, the Java patch, WebLog, tuxedo and a people tools patch so you're talking 35 physical machines we're patching every quarter um, you know and th that just is overwhelming at times next slide please so that's just the physical boxes we also once again as I mentioned we have services running we have 41 people soft instances running at this moment which is development for each of the three systems test, UAT, production, various other testing and staging areas. In that scheme of those 41, there are 81 application servers, 78 process schedulers, and 86 web servers. All of those items have to be patched individually in one way or the other. So um, once again, the whole lots of things to do. Next slide, please. Uh, this is kind of the visual representation of that. It clearly doesn't cover every uh, node because there are a total of 245 different services running at any point on our system. Um, of those, we have to reconfigure each application server. That's the 81. And then the uh, we have to reconfigure the 78 process schedulers. And we have to redeploy 86 web servers every quarter. That is... The, the web servers are more than just uh, running a command. You have to actually redeploy them and then do a lot of um, post redeployment stuff, which we've scripted a lot of that, but it's still um, prone to errors. Next slide, please. So here's what we're hoping will come of this move to containers. Um, our intention is to have several images that we use to build all of them. We're, we're hoping to have like an OS image that's, you know, the base that we put our packages on and various other items. Uh, we'll, we'll then take that and build our tools image. Um, People Tools is the base for everything in PeopleSoft. And from that, we can build an application image for each application, such as Campus Solutions, HR, Finance. Um, in PeopleSoft, WebLogic, the uh, web servers are generic across every system so we'd only have to have one for that and then we would have two for um, an application server and process scheduler um, they can run separately as paul was kind of mentioning separate services each each container it's nice if you can have one service per container um, and so once these are built hopefully you know you just start a web logic container you start the number of apps application servers contain uh, application server containers and process scheduler containers for each of those systems um, the hope is this will uh, you know greatly speed up the patching process because in theory we're only patching one of each of these systems as opposed to uh, 35 physical machines we're, we're building seven images um, uh, next slide please So I guess if you were to think of it from the PeopleSoft patch cycle, this would, each row would represent um, an image that we would create. We would have our OS patch, and then there'd be a PeopleTools image, which would be like 855610. Uh, there would be a Tuxedo patch uh, image, which would have the rolling patch 42. And then you would have your two application, or three in our case, um, for your CS image, your finance image. And then we would have our WebLogic um, K 
contain our image running or built with uh, the current CPU. What we find is uh, with everything that's happening in in the world of web server vulnerability, we're patching our um, web, logic, web logic server more than quarterly at times, depending on how critical it is. So it would be nice to be able to just patch your container, build your image, push your image out, and then bring down the old server and bring up the new one, um, as opposed to having to go to each server manually bringing them down and patching it. You're talking minutes versus you know maybe a half hour per server, depending. Um, and then obviously the other rows represent the, the next quarter and the next quarter. Um, next slide, please. So this goes back to the uh, first image we saw where we were applying a physical patch, several physical patch to each of those servers. In this case, the beauty of the, you know, the, uh, the images you're building is that instead of patching these, you're simply running an image or running a, a taking an image and running that as a container for each of those services. So where you were spending many hours patching, you're just spending minutes running them. Um, at the moment, we don't have, you know, this is all a combination of AEWS and on-prem services. So we, we don't, you know, we're not planning on running uh, orchestration just yet. It would still be uh, us manually starting them, but yeah, you know, that's, that is a future plan, hopefully. Next slide, please. So, as I said, there are many problems in the manual process beside the uh, man hours spent quarterly. Uh, one of the things we see is uh, we'll miss a redeployment of a web server. Um, sometimes those uh, process schedules or application servers don't get reconfigured, and sometimes we'll miss SSO files. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, uh, especially if it's in production, it's a negative impact uh, with students or faculty members sees um, your people tools versions don't match uh, not something we want to ever happen so when it does um, you know, that's not a good thing but with this process all of these images that we've been ta talking about will be vetted in development and tests in UAT and by the time they get to production nobody's modifying those images they stay the same once they're fixed and we just start it. There's no missing redeployments of the web servers or app or uh, reconfiguration. SSO files are already in there. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we you know we're still using an older um, uh, web auth system, and so we have to copy jar files in for the servlets um, and whatnot. Um, and so obviously, any of those things happening is a negative thing for us. And using containers, we believe, will resolve that. Next slide, please. So the solution, um, we believe that moving forward to, um, sorry, next slide. There we go. Um, so we think that, you know, after a lot of discussion, the containerizing PeopleSoft will make the whole process easier from manpower to eliminating problems to scalability. Um, you know, one of the things we, we do see is Paul had mentioned is most of the things we're running here or, or don't have a lot of scaling problems except our campus solutions. So right now we're running about uh, six web servers and five application servers for um, the campus solutions student system. And we don't need that probably more than a handful of times a year. So the ability to scale them with some, you know, orchestration system would be a, a huge money saver to us, we hope. Um, so that's kind of it for what I wanted to talk about. Like I said, the group report was kind of quick because that's the beauty of it. it. It isn't a lot of effort now from the setup and maintenance side. And then, you know, a lot of people say, well, where would I use this outside of uh, internet to and the um, trusted access platform? And, you know, for us, we find that PeopleSoft might be one of those places. Thanks. Um, Chris, one of the uh, a couple of the questions in the uh, chat window are about whether Oracle supports running PeopleSoft in containers, or you've gotten any special kind of support from Oracle for running them in containers. That's actually a great question. Um, they they support OSs. Um, they we actually we've had more issues with running the you know getting quote support for databases in RDS. 
Um, the official line we've heard from them is that we will support the application and the tools. Um, and if it's something related, like for example, for RDS, if it's an RDS issue, then that's not on us. So we will, we do get support for that. We have um, talked to them about that. And I think from their perspective, they don't know it's, they have no idea it's in a container. Um, you're, you know, we're, you, one of the beauty, one of the nice things is it's supposed to be lightweight, but unfortunately Oracle does require uh, enterprise operating system. So I'm actually pulling the um, Oracle enterprise um, Linux server down, which is a hog. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, we haven't, ha we haven't seen anything that would, would prevent them from supporting us. Great. Thanks. Let's uh, give it a few more moment, moments to see if some more questions come in the Slack channel. I mean, the Slack channel. I got Slack on the brain. Sorry. The chat channel. Yeah, actually, Todd uh, Todd Hadaway posted in there uh, the official take on this stuff. Um, yeah, about, you know, Oracle will support the software stack. They just won't, um, you know, as expected, won't support Docker or container issues, which, you know, that's as expected, as he said. Yeah, there is a question too about how you manage people's soft customizations when you deploy a new container. Well, actually, so we, like I said, this, we've just started this process and that is a good question because that's one yeah. of the things we're struggling with. Um, not struggling with, but you have to make a decision. Um, with web servers, you deploy a uh, web logic web server and then there are lots of things built into that. Um, Right now we're playing with, do you have a, do you create an image for each development test, UAT, or do you, as part of your uh, command to start your container, do you build it on the fly? Um, that's one of the areas where we've actually played with right now. We're building those on the fly. Um, you know, we're doing it a reverse proxy server because we are trying to start shibboleth too. So, um, breaking the one service per uh, container rule there, unfortunately. But yes, um, what some of the other issues we thought will have to be addressed are like um, flat files in PeopleSoft. We're just going to mount, most likely mount a file system into each of those containers for the flat files because they can change while the containers are live in theory. Great. Um... Somebody also asked, uh, do you plan on sharing any documentation or anything like that once you get this nailed down? I, I would love to do that. Um, you know, it, it's uh, like everybody doing this, it's a big learning process. Um, so I don't see any reason we wouldn't. Great. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we're done. Thank you both for uh, sharing your insights and your experience. Yeah, yep, sure. And I, just a few, a uh, couple of informational things. Um, the, the 2019 TechX is coming up a little later this year. It's in December. And there's a link there for more information. We'll have two days of campus case studies, uh, just like the one you've just heard for the last hour. And then that's also where Advanced Camp takes place, where we run an unconference and talk about uh, issues of interest to IDM. We also have upcoming training sessions for the software mentioned here today, as well as co-manage and midpoint. Uh, all of these are based on the uh, containerized versions, the in common trusted access platform. And you can see the link there and also the, the dates, the uh, SHIB workshops coming up here pretty quick. Uh, and then as I post posted in the chat, uh, please take a minute to fill out the evaluation. We use those for uh, feedback to improve and also there's a spot for uh, uh, recommending other issues or other, uh, other programs for IAM online. So once again, thanks to Paul and Chris, and thanks for everybody for coming today, and we'll see you next month.